experienced as a person in San Francisco at that time? No, it was actually down in Los Angeles, and it was oh, for okay. the company that I used to work for before then, and it's a true story. Okay. It's one of those things in life that you have as an experience. You know, you're, you're observing, observing of it. It also is affecting you, and it makes you, I think, really ashamed of the human race. Okay. I mean, it's that bad. Uh, I had a big order entering it. They were, they were happy about this. They should have been happy about the size of the order. It was a, you know, enough to kind of order to put on a second shift in one of the mills. And the president of the company turned it down because he, quote, didn't want to, didn't, uh, want to do business with Jews. But that wasn't the, um, uh, that anti-Semitism was not in the aluminum company where you did have, no. you were. No, as a matter of fact, it was exactly the opposite. We, uh, we, uh, breakfast is ready, huh? We, uh, I sh particularly showed, we set up a joint venture, okay? And two of the individuals in the joint venture were successful businessmen, they were Jewish, okay? And eventually Rhonda, who's the wife of Jim, was invited into the, uh, into the inner sanctum, which is really just five or six people. And she's Jewish, and the guy who was heading up the company, who's the chairman of the board, said, ah, he says, now the, now the Jews, uh, now we Jews have a chance against you Gentiles. I mean, it was a lot of humor. It was like above the board, they used the word mensch, which is the highest compliment that a Jew can pay to a Gentile. Interestingly enough, it means man, uh, as opposed to friend. So there's a lot of that tie. Uh, Rhonda's Jewish, her father's Jewish. Uh, uh, Jim and Rhonda go to visit him in his dying day. He lived in Philadelphia as a lawyer. And uh, it's very moving because in his declining days he became a uh, Messianic Jew, which is, considering how conservative he was, was the last thing you'd expect. Um, so it's pro-Jewish. Rhonda in her grief uh, turns to uh, the Hanukkah celebration. And interestingly enough, another Jew comes to take the, the, the participants through the prayers. So it's got a, it's got a very subtle, I think, positive Jewish, uh, uh, pro-Jewish uh, bias. Uh, you wouldn't really know, if you just read it quickly, you probably wouldn't see it, okay? But if you can now listen to what I've said, and if you could also see the way the book starts, telling about you know, how terrible this uh, example was, you'd, uh, you'd appreciate that there's some redressing of the, uh, of the, of the prejudice. At that time, um, was there anything done about the anti-Semitic attitude? Yeah, the uh, guy who the guy who per perpetrated it. Well, I had a relationship. I don't know when all of this happened exactly, but I had a relationship with the chairman of the board of the company. Okay, and it's because uh, I grew up with his kids, and uh, he he uh, he and I were pretty close. And when I told him about it, he was just outraged. And so, in the book, okay. It, I read that, or I state that, that this individual who's anti-Semitic, he, he retired at 52 years old. Well, nobody retires at 52. And he was replaced with a Jew. So the retribution and the, the, the circling came about. So there is something that was done about it, yes. Now, I don't truly know, because I didn't follow the whole story, whether, whether there was something done about it, but that's back to the imagination of figuring out, you know, that this was a grievous, uh, bit of behavior and it needed redressing. Okay, now, both of your uh, novels so far have been set somewhat out west, mm -hmm. meaning um, in California and then on the Circle P. How did you move from there to Norton, Ohio? Well, that's a good question. I was transferred by the company I worked for in, in San Francisco and their headquarters were in Cleveland. That was over 40 years ago, and that's one of those decisions in life. You look at it and you say, what if, you know? There's no easy way to say it was the right decision or the wrong decision. From a business standpoint, it might have been wrong. From bringing up a family in Ohio as opposed to bringing up a family in California, it definitely was right. There's just no question about that. So that's the answer to your question. I'm going Eastern. Uh, in one of these uh, ventures. Uh, well, I was going to ask you if Norton is ever going to be a part of any of your writings in the future. Well, now you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I'm not going to make, I'm not gonna to make it normal, <laughs> my normal Weisenheimer kind of comment. I hope people in Norton read this book. I hope they truly do. And if they do, fine. 
uh, I will go over to downtown Norton and I'll say how much I appreciate it, which I do. Um, Jake said, Antietam, Bloody Antietam is a different kind of a book. I've got the story. Now, this is one in the works. This is one in the works. Actually, it's only in the works to the extent I've written up the storyline, okay? And I, have the, and I have some of the research done. My son says he wants to co-author it with me, which would be fine. I have no problems with that. Have you done the research on the Battle of Antietam already, or are you still in the midst no, of that? Well, no, I've, I'm getting down to the end. It's very complex. There's a ton of stuff that's been written about it. Uh, my editor and I visited uh, the Antietam battlefield and took 95 pictures or more. Um, I haven't been to South Mountain, which is the battle that was fought before Antietam that had a lot to do with where Lee's position was and, and Longstreet. Um, I, I'm, I'm satisfied with it. some more uh, research. I just better get writing. I mean, there's a point at which, as you probably know, there's a point at which you can over, overlook or oversee a, a situation. You mean study it too much? Yeah, study it too much, and then, you, and then you get into the frozen bit. Of, I've studied it so much, I can't write that well. You know. Well, the truth of the matter is, yeah, you can if your storyline is good. Uh, so I've got Antietam, Bloody Antietam, and then that's, that's a takeoff on a genre which, when I first saw it, I didn't like it, being a you know, stubborn English major. I, what I said was, that, that's just not the right way to go. <laughs> so, and I was wrong, um, as is true about a lot of things. It's the blend between history and, and fiction, and it's called the historical novel. And we have a lot of examples of it today. It's very popular. And what it says, in effect, I'm, gonna, I'm at the Battle of Gettysburg, and this is Lee talking to himself. And boy, boy am I in trouble, because the Yankees have got all of those positions up above me, and I am the guy, who, the old gray fox, who normally gets those positions. So I'm in for a slacking. Okay, well, now he, I don't know whether he thought that or not, but the writer says, yes, he did. Does it make a good story? Absolutely. Uh, is this writer, the one I'm thinking of is Jeff Shahara. Um, is he a good writer? Oh yeah, he's an excellent writer. But he has this genre which is not history and it's not fiction, it's a blend. Uh, I want to do that with Antietam. I, my characters are, probably didn't exist, but I want them all over the battlefield talking to all of the generals so they can see you know, what, the what the story is. And I want a, one from the Confederates side and one from the uh, Union side. And they, I want them to meet 60 years after, not 60, 40 years after the, uh, after the battle. I want them to talk about it and go through the, you know, the flashbacks. So that's the, basically Antietam story. No, that's, the one in, that's one in the works. Yes, sir. And, and it's, I'll tell you, it's at least two years away, maybe more, because I've got so much more writing to do. Then the, la the last one on this list is uh, another, and I, and I think I might be one of the only writers to really tackle this. Uh, because it's a tough subject. The, <coughs> the mountain men, between 1825 and about 1840, used to meet annually at something called a rendezvous. And they picked different places, uh, places that you can actually look up on a map. And they had a lot of bad behavior. Okay, they drank a little bit, they played some cards, they talked to Indian women, they went on and on. Okay, but this is their, their one event during the year in which they came out of the kind of loneliness that they had and, and rubbed up against other human beings. I want to write a novel about that. Um, I, I've done some research on it, and my major problem, and to a certain extent this is true with, the, with Antietam, is, catch, is getting the idiom. <laughs> it was very difficult. They had different slang. <coughs> they had different uh, uh, sentence structure in some cases. They, uh, the, the spelling is all phonetic. You know, it wasn't until after the Civil War in this country that it was, all, it was phonetic spelling. So I got I to gotta get into that. And I don't quite know how to get into it because that here comes the imagination because I don't have any experience with talking to mountain men, <laughs> you know. But that's that's what kind of like what I see as ahead. Okay, now you have some others there on that list. Yeah. Uh, that uh, what are they going to be? Well, one uh, my editor and I are having a discussion about this, but one that I want to publish is called Down the Road, and it's short stories, and there are fifteen of them. And in the center of that book is, uh, is a novella I've written about a Ben Hastings, okay, Jim's cousin. Uh, so that would be anchoring. Um, there are 15 short stories. It, the writing is good to not so hot, but I want to get these short stories off the word processor. Uh, so I thought of making that next. Now the comment I've had from a, from a noted publisher was, nobody writes short stories. The only time you write short stories is when you're dead. And, uh, 
<laughs> I don't agree with that, okay, because Hemingway's introduction into literature was a short story, and, there, and he was a master of it, perhaps a better writer of short stories than, than novels. So I want to write that, um, and then I'm into Jake's journey, which is the story of Jake McCarthy, and I'm about halfway through. I've got 200 pages, and i got at least another 200 to go, because I'm getting his family involved and all this sort of thing. So that's the, that's the writing. So you have a lot in the work, so you have plenty of work to do. More than uh, that, yeah. In the future, uh, including research, as well as putting the words together to yeah. come up with what you... Uh, now, is there... Number one last thing here. Is there a moral to the story of what you... Carpe viam? Meaning, do yeah. you have a... Yeah, I do. I, I do, but I don't hammer the reader with it. I, okay. I don't believe in that. I, I think it's if you more want, subtle. Yeah, it's more subtle. I hope. I think if you want to lecture, that you go into the lecture hall. If you want to write fiction, you've got to not force, but you got to let the reader draw out what the what the themes are. And the thing is kind of like this: that, and this is philosophically and religious, but I see no reason why we can't build a connect between our Judeo. Uh, side, okay, which we certainly got. Jesus was a Jew, um, and our Christian side, Jesus was a Jew. Very hard if you talk to Jews to do this, but on the other hand, there are many that are seeing it, seeing it exactly like that. After two thousand years, they, you know, they finally, finally are meeting the, uh, meeting the Messiah. Uh, I think that's very important in our society. I think what it does is it eliminates the considerable anti-Semitism. I mean, you can account it, and it's not just in. Nazi Germany, okay, it's also all over the globe. It's, it's, uh, it's in our country. It's very corrosive, it's very divisive, and it's very wrong, okay? And it just isn't anti-Semitism, it's the anti-anybody who's in the minority. So I, th I think it's a serious problem. Here, what I try to show is, is it doesn't have to be that way that people can get along with different religious backgrounds. And uh, interestingly enough, Sam Babin, who's Rhonda's father, uh, was, was a very conservative Jew and said, in effect, to Ronnie, you're not going to marry, I'm going to pick, you know, your, your mate, which is typical, and you're not going to marry a Gentile. Well, he married, he married a Mormon, okay, and so she says to him, well, you're just being totally hypocritical about this. When he's near dying, he, he gives uh, Jim and Rhonda his blessing. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not married at that time simply because, as Rhonda says, it, was kill, it would kill my dad mm -hmm. if, if we did this. So he gives the blessing. They go ahead and get married. He passes away uh, with, uh, you know, a distinguished career behind him. And uh, I think when I wrote this, I had to tell you I choked up because of the <coughs> relationship between Ron and her father, um, and also the acceptance of Jim into the family. What's, okay, what's, one what's last the thing lesson? Is what's the lesson really? Is basically, do we have to have prejudice to exist as human beings? Is is it really? in our mix, okay? Or is it something we acquire because somebody made a comment at one time when you were young and all of a sudden, you know, that kind of like colors your, colors your life. One last thing. You can find the book at what website? Okay, my website, is that on the screen? No. Uh, www.diamondkbooks, all one word, dot com. And your telephone number in case? Yeah, it's 330-334-1277. Thank you, Mike, for another interview, and I wish you success with your latest novel. Thanks, Bo. Appreciate it.